Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> That's pretty good uh, for a Sunday cold morning. Um, I have a friend who's going to be speaking with us today. I remember the very first time I met him, and uh, it was in New York City. He pastors a great church there. And we've actually served on a, a couple of boards and done some work together. Um, his heart is phenomenal for God's people and for our world. And he has an amazing capacity to communicate truth in a way that makes us just want to lean in. So would you please give a very warm Calvary welcome to a very good friend of mine, Pastor Chris Delmaj. Praise the Lord. Well, thank you, thank you. It's so good to be back here, and I am incredibly humbled to be here in the hospitality of Pastor Bob and Sister Sue. I appreciate you guys so much. Uh, the amount of respect that I have uh, for your senior pastor really cannot be measured. And so I am fully aware of the quality of spiritual food that you normally receive here. I'll do everything in my power not to serve you stale fries this morning. Um, but even before I go, I'm going to need extra prayer because you see, uh, yesterday I got off a flight, uh, a plane coming from the Dominican Republic, and I was able to spend a week there with my wife. We were hanging out, we were chilling. It was great. I totally forgot what Rochester felt like as I was driving. <laughs> and uh, when I left the hotel room this morning and I came outside, I could not believe how cold. It was, but by the grace of God, I pray that we'll be able to get through this. Amen. If you don't mind, bow your heads with me. Just ask God for help that I can do this right. And so, Lord, I just thank you, God, for allowing me to be here this morning. Thank you for this time together with my family, Lord. We pray, oh God, that you will be glorified, that the, the spotlight will shine on you, and that we can leave this place receiving something from you that would radically change our lives. And so, thank you, God, once again for this opportunity to share. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, my text is going to be taken from Luke chapter 19. I'll be reading from verses 1 through 10. And here's the thing. Um, the, the story is about Zacchaeus. This biblical account is about Zacchaeus. And usually what jumps out at me is just this amazing concept of salvation. And, and, and I'm always um, just fascinated with salvation especially with what the Bible doesn't tell us. Like we know that you know, someone will come to the Lord and they'll get saved, but what we don't know or what we don't really see and understand is why that person would that at that moment at that time. Like that's always fascinating to me. I was raised in church. My dad's a pastor. My mom's a pastor. My older brother is a pastor. My youngest brother's a pastor. They're all pastors except the middle child. And so I was raised in church and I gave my heart to the Lord when I was about 19 and if I could be honest with you, I had absolutely no intention of becoming a Christian the day I got saved. And so 26 years later, I'm still fascinated at what, what, what are the pieces that God allows to come to pass for us to finally say yes. And the reason why this matters to me is because I still have family members that I want to see come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. My oldest daughter, even though things are much better, I have a desire for her to come to that place. And, and so when I read this text, I want you to consider that. This is about Jesus and Zacchaeus, and this is what it says. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through, and there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was, and he was unable due to the crowd because he was short in stature. Anybody know what that feels like to be? <laughs> and what's interesting about that concept is that you know, as a human being, no matter how great you think you are, there's always something about you that is quote unquote short in stature. Now I'm six feet tall, so I'm not necessarily short in stature, but based on the medical opinion, my doctor informed me that I am what's known as morbidly obese. I don't really care for that word or term at all, <laughs> right? Because according to them, a person who's six feet tall should weigh a certain amount. And no one informed me. 
And so what I'm understanding is that Zacchaeus was short in stature and there was a crowd and he was trying to see Jesus. So he couldn't do it. So this way, verse four, he ran on ahead and climbed up a sycamore tree in order to see him because he was about to pass through that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry up, come down for today I must stay at your house. Here's my first point. It's called the situation. And please understand, these points all have the letter S because of the whole alliteration thing. And I really did my best, so don't laugh when you hear the other points. But this first point is the situation. The situation, number one, is that Zacchaeus was a tax collector. Now, to some of us, and you know, perhaps there's someone who works in the IRS in the crowd. God bless you. We love you. Don't audit us. And... But back then, a tax collector was chosen by the, the, the Roman Empire, the government, to tax the people in this area. And they thought it would be prudent, they thought it would be a good idea if the person collecting the taxes was one of them that had the same understanding of tradition and cultures, possibly the same uh, 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 ethnicity. And so it would be easier for them to give up their finances in terms of taxes to someone who looked like them. Well, guess what? Zacchaeus was this guy. But here's the problem. Because Zacchaeus was working for the Roman Empire, he pretty much could do whatever he wanted in terms of taxes. So if Zacchaeus came to your house and it was the, uh, the empire tax of 5%, he comes to your house and he realized that you have a beautiful manicured lawn and you have a new Cadillac. And so he says, today's tax is 8%. And he'll give the 5% to the Roman government, but then he'll pocket the 3%. And then he'll go to your next door neighbor and they have a new pool and he'll say, uh, it's 7%. And he'll give to the Roman Empire the 5% and he'll pocket the 2%. In other words, he was a thief. And the people knew that because they did not have any recourse. They could not call the cops on him because he was the law. And so they all knew that if you're a tax collector, you're a thief. But the Bible goes further. The Bible says not only was Zacchaeus a tax collector, he was the chief. So not only does he take your money, but then he also skims from the person that took your money also. And so this guy is the worst of the worst. He doesn't have any friends. And you know what? What type of person must you be that you are willing to steal from your own people? You're willing to steal from those who are already having a difficult time. And so please understand, culturally, a tax collector, this impacted their family. This impacted their, their, their role in society. He was not wanted even from his own people. So he wasn't Roman enough to be loved by the Romans, but he wasn't Jewish enough to be loved by the Jews. And so he was there. He was a tax collector. Emotionally, he, was, um, he had his heart filled by what he did. But the Bible says this no good tax collector had a desire to see Jesus. See, that's a little bit where I want to spend time with today because sometimes we'll see someone based on the outside appearance. We'll see somebody based on what they do and where they come from. But we, we sometimes miss as children of the Most High God that thing that would still allow them to want to see Jesus. The Bible doesn't even explain to me why he wants to see Jesus because truth, be, it doesn't matter. The goal is he wants to see Jesus. And the Bible said he goes. Now, there's two things that's blocking him from seeing Jesus. Number one, it's his stature. His stature. He's just too short. He doesn't have the height like everybody else does. He doesn't have that regular advantage. And so the thing I want to bring to your attention is that the Bible lets us know that we're all faulty. We all have issues, no matter who you are. Maybe you're not heightly challenged, but there's some other challenge that you and I deal with, you and I will have to deal with. But, but, but more importantly, there's a challenge that makes it difficult to see Jesus. Am I allowed to say that? Am I allowed to share that today? There's something inside of each and every one of us that actually does make it a little bit more difficult to receive the good news. And the Bible says he was short, but even more importantly, the crowd was in the way. Do you know what it's like to want to see Jesus, but the people who want to see Jesus are just in your way? Do you know what it's like to have Christianity be in the way of you seeing Jesus? And this is Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus, he wants to see Jesus. He's just not like everybody else. He wants to see Jesus, but he has a challenge that blocks. But the Bible lets us know that the situation was not just was he imperfect, but even the crowd that he was around was blocking his sight. 
I've had to deal with this quite a bit, even growing up. Like I said, I was raised in church, and, and, and one of the downsides of being a pastor's kid is you see uh, what happens after church. You see how people treat you, and you see how people treat your family, you see how people treat your dad. And, and, and let me tell you, um, it's not all glitters, it's gold. And I was, and there's a lot of anger and hatred and malice inside of me all those years, which actually prevented me from accepting Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. In fact, this is the last thing I want to do. <laughs> if I had my choice, I'd be selling real estate. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'd be selling real estate. But inside each and every one of us, there's, there's, there's a challenge there. And we, we may not even be ready to share it in front of anybody, but, but the truth is there's a challenge. It's a situation. Which brings us to number two, the shifting. I, I use this word, the shifting, because verse four says, so he ran ahead. I love this part because no matter what your challenge is and no matter how bad your church is, there will never be excuse to miss glory. No matter what you're struggling with, no matter what you're dealing with, no matter what family you were born into, no matter who you married, that will never be an excuse to miss Jesus. And so the Bible says in verse 4, even with his challenge, even though they were not as happy to see him in church, the Bible said that didn't stop him, so he ran ahead. At verse 4 in my notes, I wrote the word shift. There was a shift. That word shift by definition is this, to change or transfer from one place or position to another. In other words, no matter what your challenge is, my challenge is Dunkin' Donuts. Don't allow Dunkin' Donuts to keep you from seeing Jesus. Before I came to know the Lord as Savior, I was smoking cigarettes all the time and I was smoking weed all the time. No matter what that challenge is, no matter what that craving is, don't allow that craving, don't allow that challenge to keep you from seeing Jesus. You know what you need? There needs to be so then he ran ahead. There needs to be a shifting. There needs to be a shifting. I can't allow individuals to have power over me. There needs to be a shifting. So don't let anyone stop you from seeing Jesus. Don't let anything stop you from seeing Jesus. Two things that he did that, to me, defines a shift. The first thing he did, he ran ahead. Can I be real with you? Sometimes the people that you're with will not allow you to see Jesus. Sometimes you need to step away and step ahead. The Bible says he knew where Jesus was going, and so he ran ahead to see if he can get a better look. I know what that means. I have friends. I have family members. In fact, I went to uh, Zion Bible uh, Institute. It was North Point now, and I'll never forget my, uh, my, my freshman year. I was only saved uh, for like four months. And I have friends, I played college football, and a lot of my boys, we, we played football, but you know, also while we played, we drank a lot, we smoked a lot, and so, and so I was getting ready to go home to see them, and the, uh, the, the college, well, not the, the class president, the person I really respected said, Chris, I just don't think you're ready. I said, who are you talking to? What do you mean I'm not ready? First of all, you don't know me. You don't know who I am. These are my boys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not going in. I was going on in, and he was gonna. He was actually driving me from Rhode Island to, to Long Island, and that was a very awkward three and a, three and a half hour trip because I just didn't want to talk to this guy. You don't know me. You talking about? And so, sure enough, as soon as I got home, I got on my bike, and I rode my bike to my boy's house. His name is Logie, and as soon as I walked in, he said, "Yo!" And they were playing dominoes. Dudes over there were playing spades. I said, yes! And as you entered into that basement, there was an herbal essence, uh, of essence just, 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 oh, just in, on the ceiling. And I said, yeah! It was great, my friend. But see, I knew I was going to go there as the light. I knew it because I'm a child of God now. I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to smoke. I'm not going to curse. And so we started playing dominoes, and we're playing dominoes. Yes! And we're very, very competitive when we play dominoes, and people can't cheat. You're not allowed to talk when you play dominoes. They're not supposed to give signs. And this person thought, and you lie. I said, no, I'm not lying. You lie. He cursed at me, and I cursed back at him. <laughs> and when I cursed, all my boys said, there he goes. That's my man. Where you been? I knew that Christian. Brothers and sisters, it was downhill from there. 
For the next two and a half hours, I took a, I took a, a, a Christian vacation, or better, a vacation from Christianity. And what made it worse was I was supposed to share in youth group that night all the wonderful things that God has done for me. Needless to say, I had a, a sudden case of a tummy ache, and I wasn't able to go to church that night because I was so embarrassed at the failure. I didn't know that I was still short in stature. I didn't know. In order for me to see Jesus, I knew on that day that as much as I loved them, I'm going to have to shift for a while. I had to shift from. And so I understood that. And some of us, some of us, we're not willing to shift. And we still want to see Jesus. Now, mind you, it's awesome that you still want to see Jesus. But in order for you to actually get to see him, you just might have to shift. Does anybody know what I'm talking? Can someone say amen to that? But here's a second thing that was interesting. He ran ahead, so he shifted, but then the Bible says he climbed a sycamore tree. He climbed a tree. Here's what you might not realize. Uh, in, in the ancient Jewish tradition, even to this day, men of great stature in the community, they'll do everything possible not to allow their ankles to ever be seen, much less their legs. Never. Which is why they had the long robes, and that was a sign that you were somebody. And especially if you were short, like Zacchaeus, you wanted to get all of, you know. And so the last thing he would ever want was for someone to see his legs. But in order to see Jesus, it required him to change his position and shift. And the only thing he could see that would actually work because of his short stature, was a tree. In other words, in order for him to see Jesus, people might have to see his legs. It's a question of vulnerability. And for some of us, it's weird. We want to see Jesus, but we still want to be me. But in order for that to happen, you have to be willing to climb that tree. I know a couple of years back, you know, y'all remember hashtag me too? Hashtag me too. And so if I could be real with you, I really felt like my masculinity was being attacked in my home, right? And, and, and with a lot of my young adults and so forth and so on. And so I'll be the first one to push back. Get out of here, I'm a man. Get out of here, I'm a man. Get out of here, I'm a man. I'm a man, I'm a man, I'm a man, I'm a man. I'm a man. I, I push back with my wife. I push back with some of my young adults and there were youth that I had. And I push back, push back. And I never forget this one particular day. My son, um, he was about 13, 12 years old, and uh, we were getting ready for school, and I will give them breakfast, and, and my wife had already left for work, and uh, one of his G.I. Joe men or stick figure men, whatever, it, it broke. And he was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this broke. And, uh, what, I said, would you stop already? Stop acting like a little girl. And my daughter, who must have been waiting for this moment, <laughs> She must have been. She had her cocoa right here. She had her pinkies extended, and she took a sip. She went, so daddy, what does that mean? Stop acting like a little girl. And I saw her face, and her eyes were up like this. Does that mean that you don't want him to act like me? because I'm unable to control my emotions? It, it's because I'm not able to deal with difficulty? Is it because, and I'm like, oh my goodness. And she, she got me, she, 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 she's got me. She was only 14. I was not aware that my word choices, I was not aware that my, voc my vocabulary, I was raised, don't act like a girl, come on, gird up yourselves like a man. So I was not aware that this is how it could easily be interpreted by one of my favorite females of all time, which is my daughter. That's my mini-me. I would never want you to feel like you can't achieve. I would never want you to feel that you are secondary. And she says, well, that's how you make me feel. For me to hear that, I had to take a step back. I'm like, first of all, in all my years of living, my parents never apologized to me. I'm not going to break family tradition now. <laughs> but what I did realize was that if I missed that, how many other things am I missing? I 
couldn't believe it. And so I broke family tradition. I said, baby, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean for you to feel that way. I, I didn't know you felt that way. Thank you for sharing that with me. What else? <laughs> and I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be real with you. I'm going to be real. My, 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 my daughter and my son, my youngest daughter and my son, because of my invitation, I said, help me communicate with you. I want to know. What I didn't know was that even though they were being raised in church, even though that they were you know, with me, and, 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 and I didn't know that my son was considering stepping away from Christianity because to him, Christianity all of a sudden meant hate. I didn't know that. But in order for me to even have that conversation with him, I had to use this V word. I had to become ready, vulnerable. Instead of me being full of pride that the pastor's kids are struggling with this, I had to show my legs to my own kids. I need to see Jesus. I need to see Jesus and hear from him the things that I thought I already knew, only to find out that I didn't. I needed to see him. Guess what? Even as a pastor, I had to experience what? A shift. I thank God for that because my son, he was very serious, and I was able to look at him. I said, listen, if you decide not to follow Jesus, can you give me the right of first refusal? I just want to have one conversation with you, and even after that, if you decide that this is not for you, I want you to know I will still love you. You would never be anything less than my son who I'm in love. I will never. And he started to cry. And then he shook my hand. And then he said, let's talk. I'm so thankful now because he loves the Lord. But it was a couple of difficult conversations that I was not ready to have because I, was, I wasn't ready to show my legs. If you want to shift and you want to see Jesus, perhaps you're in a situation where you, it's hard for you to see Jesus. May I suggest to you a shift to take place? I'm limited in time, but I want to share with you about my wife and I. We've been married. It'll be 25 years and two more months. And that's been, that's been an adventure. But if I could be honest with you, our marriage got better the moment I decided to show my legs. <laughs> Trust me, not my physical legs. But in terms of being vulnerable with my wife, being able to share with her stuff that I thought I shouldn't have to share and because I'm a man, but... There's something about humility that the Bible embraces. In fact, the Bible says that God will reject the proud, but he'll always give unmerited favor and love and kindness. He'll always give grace to those who are humble. And I love that about him. The moment you get close enough to the Lord, he'll say, I'll get closer to you. Don't ever underestimate the power of showing your legs. Amen? You could tweet that. Show your legs, everybody. Jesus loves you. Here's my last point. The salvation, the salvation. You know what's interesting is that when he finally got through that, he, 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 he shifted and he, he left the crowd. He climbed the tree. This is the best part about this. He sees Jesus, but then he also sees Jesus coming towards him. This was not his intention. His intention was to see Jesus. But what ended up happening was Jesus saw him. He saw him. Verse 5, when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus. Let me stop right there. I got to, because I, I cry every time I read this, because sometimes we become our biggest enemy swearing like as if God does not understand what you and I go through. I'm here to let you know, not only does he understand what you go through, he understands who you are. He knows your name. Let me back up. People hate tax collectors. People hate them. In this word, it can be used as a slur. It's fighting words if you call my mama a tax collector. We hate them. And sometimes you and I can identify ourselves with the sins that we struggle with. We can identify ourselves with being so rejected by anybody else that we even bring that into the concept that God hates you too. One of the most powerful things to ever happen was for Zacchaeus to be in that tree and for Jesus to know his name. I'm here to let you know Jesus knows your name. Everybody could hate you, but Jesus knows your name. 
Zacchaeus, you got to come down. What? I am going to your house tonight. And I love that about, sometimes I get lost in worship and people don't understand why. Because of this. The fact that no matter how crazy life gets, no matter how many times I play myself, Jesus wants to be with me. Come on down. I'm going to your house. Has any of you ever had a surprise visit from somebody? And I could never understand why my mom used to get angry when she said, you know, the least he could do is call. I didn't know what that meant when I was younger. I do now. <laughs> because the living room is not ready. There's nothing in the refrigerator. Jesus doesn't care if your house is in order. He wants to come over. And I didn't understand that. Zacchaeus, you got to come down now because I want to hang out with you. And I love that. It's called salvation. Here's a downside, though. When Zacchaeus agreed, the Bible says that the crowd was upset. So here's the word for us as believers. Don't get upset when God wants to hang out with Zacchaeus and not you right now. I have to deal with this in my church all the time because of the way I think. I know like sometimes church can be that club where you pay your membership fee every month. And so this place is for me first and foremost. But the Bible is very clear on this, that Jesus did not come for those who are already healthy. He came for those who are sick. And so it's weird to see that someone is actually having a connection with Jesus and the people got angry at that. Why would he go to his house? My house is much better. In Zacchaeus' response, he says, Lord, I'm going to give half of everything I own to the poor. And if it does come out that I've cheated people, and I know I have, I'm going to give them four times as much. He confesses, and he changes the way he thinks. He repents. And Jesus says this, and I love this part, and this is where we end, and if the, 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 the worship team can come back up. He says, today salvation has come to this house. I love this. I used to, I used to look at this this biblical account as someone who's discovering who Jesus is, but I've, I've grown since then because I realize every time I'm reading this, it's like I'm discovering Jesus over and over again. He says, today, salvation. That word salvation in Greek is soteria, and it means to rescue or to deliver. It means to rescue from something, which can also mean restoration. It can also mean healing. It can also mean deliverance. He says, today, Healing has come to this place. Today, restoration has come to this place. Today, deliverance has come to this place because someone was willing to recognize who they are and who I am, and they begin to confess and to repent and to change. But in order for salvation to happen, it required him to shift. It required him to be willing to be vulnerable. And in our lives, trust me, we don't always have it together. But there's two things I want to leave with you. The first one is Jesus said, he too is a son of Abraham. I know he might not get invited to your barbecue, but he too is under that covenant relationship that I made. No matter how crazy things can get, no matter how different you might think you are, please understand that Jesus knows your name. He knows your name. Even if, as a pastor, I don't show the love I ought to, please understand that Jesus knows your name. He knows you. Even when people get upset that you're getting that attention from the Lord, understand he's here for you in this place. I had a whole different sermon ready to be preached. And, and thank God for your pastor who is so willing. Um, and I said, I just feel like God has this one. And I don't know why, but perhaps you need to understand today that you need to know that Jesus knows your name. And all it does, it requires you is to shift. Some of us, our pride will have to come down a bit. Some of us, we have to overcome that fear of being vulnerable. But salvation is for you. It's for you. Here's a second thing. 
as those of us who are believers, it's okay to get out the way so that someone who needs Jesus can see him. It's okay. It's okay to give up the seat for someone else who needs him. It's okay. Because guess what? We're all a part of the covenant relationship. I have come to realize that as screwed up as I am, there might be somebody more screwed up. <laughs> and that's shocking. But I'm humble enough and willing enough to say, Lord, if it's not my time, then please, Lord, have your way. Amen? He knows your name. Lord, I just thank you, God, for this time together. Thank you for this family. Thank you for your love. Thank you, Lord, that even when I don't feel like I belong, Lord, you know my name. Thank you for rescuing us. Thank you for rescuing each and every one of us in this place. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.